The project was funded by Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, and the aircraft was designed by Burt Rattan, who also designed the Voyager, which in 1986 was the first aircraft to fly around the world nonstop. After Melville touched down in California's Mojave Desert, here's what the ecstatic team members had to say. Ladies and gentlemen, you are seeing the pinnacle of our program tomorrow. The pinnacle is a demonstration that you can fly people up and let them look at the black sky and go weightless. For years, the dream of traveling to space was reserved for a small government-funded few. But philanthropist Paul Allen and aviation legend Burt Rutan and a small craft called Spaceship One are planning to change the course of history. I'm here for Spaceship One launch for a civilian space plane and astronaut to go into space. My grandpa is launching his spaceship, um, the White Knight and then Proteus. We're out here to see history in the making. I, I couldn't pass this up. I took off work, I came down here, and turns out everybody had the same idea. As a child growing up, you know, during the Mercury and the Gemini and the Apollo era, you know, I always wanted to go see a space shot and never had that opportunity. It's really amazing to see it all come together and I can't believe it's here right now and it's happening and we're making history. When the earliest airplanes first took flight, people could scarcely imagine that within just a few short years, air travel would be accessible to almost everybody. Now, a lot of those early innovations in aviation were spurned on by cash prizes and awards, not dissimilar to the X Prize. 1908, 1909, when there had only been 10 people that had flown. I don't think anybody knew what airplanes were for. There were some thoughts about them being military, but people weren't thinking about airliners and jumbo jets. In four years, in 39 countries, Countries. There were hundreds of airplane new types, and there were thousands of, of pilots. They just wanted to fly because they had the passion and the thought to get in a machine and travel at these ferocious speeds of 50 miles an hour, and to be up there with the birds and be able to look down on the houses. That was enough to create hundreds of airplanes, thousands of pilots in 39 countries by itself. I took risks on this program that I didn't have to take. Uh, the, most, the most noticeable and most obvious from the outside is that we developed an entirely new type of, of feathered re-entry that allowed us to, unlike the X-15 or the shuttle, we can plunge directly into the atmosphere uh, and, and do it safely. We hope that this, is this, this generates the same kind of inspiration for, for more private vehicles, private flights, that can give people the experience of space and then we can keep expanding the envelope from there. Our ship is essentially 100% uh, carbon fiber, graphite structure, but if it were built out of aluminum, it would have to be significantly bigger and its rocket engine would probably be something like 20% more expensive. As the sun rose over the desert, excitement began to rise as Spaceship One and White Knight were pulled out of the hangar and began the final preparations to taxi out for takeoff. Spaceship One and its mothership have begun their initial climb. They'll climb up to around 50,000 feet where White Knight will launch Spaceship One and rocket into history. We'll bring you the historic event after this break. And now we're just moments away from the historic launch. It was uh, spectacular, it really was. The view from up there, I was so sad that Bert and Paul couldn't be with me because looking out of the window and seeing this uh, white clouds over the L.A. Basin just looked like snow on the ground. And Edwards Air Force Base Lake looked about that big. And uh, I know I was uh, 330 or something like that, 330,000 feet when I last looked. So uh, 
You know, it was, it was uh, a mind-blowing experience. It really was. I just can't tell you how pleased I am that the Feather, which was our big risk, it worked perfect. It's the first time that a winged vehicle can have a carefree re-entry. I was a little nervous when we got in the airplane, but I was not afraid all the way up. But I was a little afraid uh, on the way down. <laughs> Boy, when, when, when you re-enter at uh, 2.9 Mach and you start hitting the atmosphere, the noises you hear are somebody talking to you very, very sharply. You know, and you, you begin to believe that, wow, should I really be doing this? But uh, I, did, I did an interesting thing that nobody was aware I was going to do. And um, when I got to Apogee, I stopped flying the airplane. I stopped, I stopped the rates. I got, it, got all the rates and all down. And then I reached in my pocket and I took out some candy-coated chocolates, all different colors, and I let them go in front of my face. And they just spun around like little sparkling things. And I was so blown away, I couldn't even fly the airplane. I got another handful and threw them out as well. A civilian trip to space is anything but routine. There were some issues with the trim controls that nearly aborted the mission. This time, right after I lit the motor, the airplane by itself rolled 90 degrees left. I stomped on a rudder pedal and put in some control and it rolled 90 degrees right, and it's never ever done that before. So at that point, I was kind of reaching for the switch to shut it down in case I was going to lose control. But I was able to get it back, get it leveled up. There was no way we would fly again without knowing the cause and without assuring that we have totally fixed it because it's a, it's a very critical system. Paul Allen and the team at Scaled Composites are clearly the front runners in the race for the X-Prize, but the window is still open for one of the other 26 competitors to take the prize. While Spaceship One's flight wasn't without its problems, it did go a long way towards advancing civilian spaceflight. From the Mojave Spaceport, I'm Jim Downs, reporting for Pulse.